Hi, Daisies. This is a trigger warning. This episode deals with themes of addiction, substance abuse, homelessness, and depression. Welcome to the Mother Days. I'm one of your hosts, Teresa Palmer. And I'm the other one, Sarah Wright Olson. (laughs) Hi, Daisies. Hi, Daisies. And we have a third host today. Um, We have my husband, Mark Weber, in the house. Hello. Oh, yay. (laughs) Hi, babe. How's it going? Good. Thank you. Shout out to Forrest for lending me his headphones. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god i am in a tiny master bedroom here in that lady mm, house and mark is cute. two rooms over in the kitchen and uh true, we decided god. to jump into an episode with my man man um as sort of this co-host situation and sarah is very familiar with mark I'm, of course, yes. very familiar with Mark. We have done lots of family holidays together. We mm-hmm. have, that's a, such an Australian word, holiday, isn't it? Vacay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for Americans, holidays are Christmas and New yeah. Year's <laughs> and Hanukkah <laughs> and <laughs> that's about it. Yeah, um, Vaca- Vacation. We, yeah, we, we take a vacation. Uh-huh. We've done vacations together. Uh-huh. And I have to say that I think I said this recently, one of my favorite vacations was our um, trip that we took to Spain because yeah. it was amazing, it was beautiful, but it was very remote. And because it was so remote, we were sort of like – forced to be still and hang out together in the in the house and outside the house so we had like sunset dance parties every night we cooked all of our meals we put the kids to bed and we sat around and like Teresa and I drank wine and we just talked and we had beautiful long wonderful conversations Uh, it was the best they were the best they were the best of the best and today (laughs) we thought we would bring well we've had the other Eric over here we've had the other hubby Eric on the show and he was (laughs) fantastic um and I loved everything he had to say about being a father and you know, that identity and he's just such a beautiful spirit. And Sarah was like, we need to get Mark on. I was like, I know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is probably going to end up being a bit of a two-parter and there is a reason mm-hmm. for that. Um, <laughs> we wanted to just sort of unpack in a uh, as real a way as possible, get super authentic, get super um, vulnerable and we want to share a little bit about like what it's like to be in partnership, to have so many children, breaking down the idea of marriage after children, marriage before children, because we know that you listeners, um, it's something that you guys navigate day in, day out, especially if you've got families and you've got little ones. And, you know, it's just such a shift when you go from not having children into having children. And Mark has had a particularly colourful life. Um, It has been in so many ways um, challenging. He's had to deal with uh, a lot of really confronting things and from an extremely young age. He's had quite an unconventional childhood, which I'm excited to talk to him about because he's very insightful and he's very open and um, there's been so much self-work surrounding, you know, those formative years of his life. And he'll be talking a lot about how that has impacted him as a man, as a father, as a husband, um, as just a person in this crazy wild world. So um, let's jump in, guys. Let's jump in. First of 
Well, thank you so much for being here and for being so open and amazing and vulnerable and wonderful. And, um, you know, I definitely want to hear your love story, which I've heard before and have, you know, so fallen in love with. But I would love to start if we can start before that. And if you can talk to us a little bit about um, your childhood and kind of like where you how you found yourself to um, Los Angeles. Um. Wow. Okay. Where do I begin? I was born in. I, I, I was born in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, to a 16-year-old single mom mm. who met my father in a halfway house, who was a heroin junkie. And for the first year of my life, I lived in a car with my mom, and then the car got totaled, so we were on the streets. And my mom and my dad were kind of on and off. She would go through periods where the abuse was too much. So she had to peace out. Um, But we would keep ending up with him. And that was the process for about five years of my life. And then my dad left me and stayed out of my life for my entire Mm -hmm. life. Reunited with him Mm -hmm. later on. So... You know, and then my life was just a a series of pretty hardcore situations, just growing up in extreme poverty with a really young mom in varying different crazy ass situations and did a serious, I've been homeless throughout my whole childhood, but did a real serious stint when I was nine years old for almost two years with my mom. And it was at wow. that point that, that my mom. And that's hard to imagine having nine year olds. I know, because mm-hmm. our kids nine-year-old are nine. little boys ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, that's what I, I know. I think about Bodhi all the time, and I see myself at that age, and it just kind of blows my mind. But yeah, so we, my mom started uh, around that time becoming a, an activist, a political activist, and an organizer. And so we started banding together with other poor women and children and men and uh, would end up doing these series of uh, actions where we would take over abandoned federally owned properties and move ourselves in, move families in, fix up the houses and use it as a form of protest to draw attention to the fact that there are all these abandoned federally owned properties. There's no reason why wow. we should we should be on the, the streets. Um, so yeah, that that was my, I mean, that was my uh, early years. Um, and then mm. we eventually relocated to the East Coast. So we went from Minneapolis to Philadelphia, which was a huge culture shock. And shock? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was crazy. I didn't know that I had a Midwestern accent until I moved to Philly. And everybody was like, <laughs> call me farm boy. And I was like, oh my God, I talk different. And then, yeah, I'd, I spent, um, had various rough years in Philly, same thing, just me and my mom always kind of floating just above the poverty line, but pretty much always well below it for the most part. Um, and mm. I went, I got into a performing arts high school, uh, which was a big deal for me. You had to audition to get in. And I was really lucky to have a, mm. a mom who was always so supportive of, my big dream, which was to be a movie star, you know? And and when I was five years old is when it really crystallized for me. I'm like, this is what I want to do with my life. And so my mom never mm. instilled any doubt or fear surrounding me being able to achieve that. So when I got into this performing arts high school, it was a big deal. So I was like, okay, now I'm, I'm on my way here. Um, there's so many long stories in this. I got kicked out of that high school for a, a whole host of other reasons. <laughs> and so I ended okay. up uh, any of them being smoking marijuana. <laughs> smoking weed. Uh, ro- the main thing was is that I became part of a graffiti crew in Philadelphia, became a graffiti writer. Nice. And okay. the school identified <laughs> us as the writers in the school. And but they couldn't ever catch us, <laughs> and it really irritated them. Um, was that really few... fun though at the time? 
It was so fun. It was amazing. Um, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> but I was also just like, I, for me, you know, I just this one track mind of like, oh, I'm an actor. I'm going to be an actor. I don't need to sit mm. in fucking geometry class. So I would right, get right. high with my friends and skip first period and then just go all in on my drama classes. And uh, right. so they didn't like the, the administration didn't like me there. My acting teacher, though, loved me. And, you know, wow. it was always really encouraging. Like, you're going to you're going to do it, man. You're going to make it. Um, so when I got kicked out, I took that same kind of fearless energy and I went to a local casting director in Philly, just unannounced and said, just showed up and was like, hey, I'm available. If you guys want to have me in for auditions, <laughs> um, I can start working. Here's my here's my schedule. Yeah, uh, like, yeah. and yeah. Totally. pretty much I'm um, just smoking weed and hanging with my dudes. Yeah, like, and I can I can actually just hang out right outside. Yeah, <laughs> great. Awesome. I'm I was, around. <laughs> I, was, I was I was I was ready to go. And Mike Lemon was the casting director in Philly, and it was cool. He saw something in me. I mean, the fact that I was just but, you know, bold mm. enough to walk in unannounced without a meeting and say, hey, I'm around. You got to give me auditions. Um, it struck a chord with him. And so he called me in for uh, mm. an audition not long after for an independent film in Philadelphia. And next thing you know, I, I book it and I'm shooting my first indie film when I was 17 years old. And so wow. I was able to wow. get the jump Gosh. on my career, you know, um, that movie got mm. me a meeting with and an at agent. That time, in New York. The money that you got for the independent film, was that more money than you had ever experienced before? What what was that like? At that time, the indie was, yeah, I mean, it was amazing to first of all be paid for being an actor. Um, but I think it, you know, it was like mm. scale, little something, but it was definitely substantial to me because it's the first time that I was making yeah. money to being an actor and anything um but it wasn't until i booked snow day when i was 18 where that was like holy shit this is a big deal like i got paid a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> in wow. yeah that is i know that's a lot of money it was different money. back then though in hollywood yeah jeez louise it was crazy. i remember that's i got paid paycheck. 200 grand for my first ever american movie 200 grand as a young like oh, 18 i was like 18 or 19 yes yeah, so, but that's what they, they would do they don't do it like, like that anymore they don't do that <laughs> anymore you have to build up to that i know <laughs> they're like and how how little can we pay them Maybe. yeah exactly <laughs> is what they say well, that was yeah that was major to get that amount of money Huge. to have those resources and then also still yeah. be very much connected to the streets and kids who are still on the streets, um, families who are still mm -hmm. on the streets. And so what I would do was the coolest thing for me was like, I got per diem and that blew my fucking mind. The fact that I got a little envelope full of cash yeah. every week, I was like, this of is cash. amazing. And oh, I would yeah. take that and I'd save it up <laughs> and every two weeks I'd Western Union it back to my mom and then she would disperse Aww. that money. And you know, I'd get, oh my so I first started getting free things or like they would give me clothes and sending stuff back. So that felt really good, you know, to be, yeah. to be making money for something I love so much to feel like I'm living my dream and to still be able to help people out. And that's become the through line in my life really. Mm -hmm. And it's really what has saved my life is to be, I got so lucky to be born into a situation where I learned that life is about being of service and showing up for mm. other people, you know, and mm. that has saved me so much. I mean, we're in an industry that has a tendency to be really yeah. vapid, vapid and very, you know, yes. focused on self, right? And, and I, it's mm -hmm, the downfall mm -hmm. of a lot of people and you can spiral into terrible situations when you become so out for self. And so I, it, it helped me navigate all these tricky, you know, moments that I've had to go through being in the industry. Um, so I was really fortunate, you know, to have come up the way that I did and, and to still today have that connection. You know, my mom lives in the Badlands of Philadelphia. She lives in between two crack houses yeah. in the largest open air 
drug market in North America. That's where she is every single day. Wow. And she, wow. she's never going to leave, you know, because she's, she's dedicated her life to helping people on a daily basis. And when I have that, mm. it, it helps navigate all the other weird, you know, uh, excessive things that come with what we do sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. I know. But yeah. it also has that like a really disorienting effect. Um, I love what you said, Mark, about it having a disorienting effect on you because I wanted to jump forward to like a month ago. And we're nice. sitting in our new home. Mm. A very expensive new home, <laughs> which has basically <laughs> made us broke, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and we're sitting in that in our sitting room and the fire's going and Mark is having, um, I call it dark Mark, <laughs> where he goes into the cave. Oh. And he's having this sort of existential <laughs> crisis where it's like, the how polarizing it is to be like living in this home and having this life and all his dreams are coming true and he all the things he's ever called in and you know dreamt of since he was a little boy he has all these things um but then also juxtaposition with this life that he came from and the poverty and mm. the reality of like the suffering in the world and we were at just this place where he felt so stuck in it. And mm. I just want to talk about that for you specifically. What does that feel like? How do you deal with it when those things come up? Because I can, I see you get derailed by these feeling, these these feelings and these emotions often. And I always think like, oh, how complicated is that to hold space for all of those things to coexist? That's a very complicated thing. Yeah, it's it's tricky. It's real. It's it's really tricky. I don't know how. I guess the way I deal with it, I'm getting better at um, allowing myself to feel okay with having a nice home and having stuff. Um, but it's not. It's not easy. It's hard. I mean, it was. You know, coming where I've come from, and then also to be still so connected to people who are actively struggling so hard, um, it's it's hard. The key is, I just you know, it's I can't devalue it for myself, you know. And I think, um, mm -hmm. and to have to get joy in seeing the way our children are are growing up and living, you know, while I'm grateful for the things that I experienced in my childhood never in a million years would I want our kids to experience what I experienced. And, and it's, and the tricky part is, is like mm -hmm. no kid should experience that. Right. And it's, it's hard when you live right. in a world and then a country that really is full of so much and it's, it becomes infuriating when you know that this doesn't need to be this way. Right. When we can just, mm -hmm pull a trillion dollars out of nowhere and like trillions of dollars go yeah. unaccounted for in government through like military mm -hmm. spending, but like people yeah. can eat, you know? And it's, yeah, it's maddening, right? Cause it doesn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes yeah. I get lost in how it just doesn't make sense and it can spin mm -hmm. me out and it, it can become painful. But I think having, you know, having this relationship with you, babe, where we're so dedicated to making sure that we use our resources and any more resources that we mm -hmm. gain in the future to help people live and to help, you know, propel their dreams. It's what um, we initially bonded it, over, I think, on that first date. Yeah. 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 It's great. It's oh, can great... we talk about that first date too? Uh, yeah. <laughs> God, that was crazy. Um, our first oh, date, we, we went to this. I mean, it's such a long, it's a long story because we had been talking for about 40 days 
over email before we even yeah. met. We never got on the phone. And, and wait, let's rewind uh, a sec yeah. because I want to talk about how you and I came to be because I'm the big believer that you were there in Philadelphia and you are living your life and you're, you know, I had a sort of, a, I was in Adelaide, South Australia, but I was, there were some similarities to, you know, being raised by a single mother and um, my mum and I were living in government housing and whilst we were not homeless and we were never homeless because my dad was relatively wealthy and he provided a home for my mum. Um, but then my mom got to the point where she was like, oh, actually, I don't really want to rely on my ex-husband. So we ended up, she chose to go into, um, back into the housing trust, you know, um, set up that they have here in Australia for people who uh, don't have a lot of money. So there were these parallel experiences. There were some things that we were both going through and you're five years older than me, so almost at the same time. Um, but <laughs> one thing that really struck me about you, and I think this is why we bonded so much over our emails, was that I tell this story, I've told it to so many people recently, about how Mark was in this abandoned building and there yes. was a crack up in the ceiling and you were, how old were you? Were you nine at the time? I think, it was, I think 10. 10. Okay. And there was a star. There was a star that he would look at through this crack and like the snow would come in and the rain and it was freezing, obviously dead of winter in Philadelphia. And like he'd look up at the star and he just really, truly felt the feelings of being a movie star and being out of that situation and having this incredible life. And he would look at it every night and his mum had him doing affirmations and he just didn't believe mm. that anything else was possible. He was like, yes, this is just what's going to happen. This is my life. And he used to think that Steven Spielberg's company was not called DreamWorks. It was Dreams Work, which I think is the mm. sweetest thing ever. And it has it's become so our sweet. little saying in our family <laughs> that dreams work. And he would tell himself, just like Steven Spielberg made it, like dreams work, dreams work. And I always get chills thinking about that because this was mm. some of the stuff that we were communicating when we first started writing each other. We met um, in 2012 uh, around like end of September, October-ish in that, I think, yeah. yeah. You probably know the exact date of that first email or that first tweet. Was it October the 4th or something? Yeah, it was in October. Yeah, I think, yeah, in yeah. October. Anyway, yeah, I was in the Bowery Hotel and I was my ex-boyfriend. It'll be very easy to work out who that was. You can just have a good old Google, people. <laughs> but my ex-boyfriend, <laughs> who I was, I had been living with that year, earlier that year, we'd been together for two years. Um, he was on a TV show <laughs> and um, he had been cheating on me with his co-star for six months and I had found this out and I was in the Bowery Hotel with one of my best friends, Brooke, and I was sobbing crying because these paparazzi mm. photos came out of him and this and his co-star and I was like, oh, I was right. Oh. I knew this had been going on and, you know, we had only officially broken up like a couple of weeks earlier so I knew that they had been together and it was so devastating and I was so sad and I was like, in one of those downward spirals where you feel like, I just want to feel even worse. And so I went online <laughs> and I was like, I'm just going to start Googling all these actresses who are way more successful than I am. So I was Googling all these girls and then I like Googled Amanda Seyfried and I was like, oh gosh, she's got another movie at Sundance. Of course she does. And I was like, oh, good for her. What is the movie? Let me just have a look anyway. And I'll be like, oh, I wonder if I even auditioned for it. Let's have a look. I probably did and I didn't get it. <laughs> oh so I looked God. at it. <laughs> <laughs> looked at it and it was <laughs> it was this movie called the end of love and I was like oh cool all right let's have a look at the trailer <laughs> looked at the trailer and I was like oh this is really sweet and I was like oh my gosh this looks like such a good movie in fact I really want to see this so I happened this is before I was on Instagram 
I tweeted about this movie and I was like, oh my gosh, this actually looks really so sweet. Like um, there's this movie that Amanda Seyfried is starring in. Um, I'm, am I saying her name right, by the way? Seyfried? Freed? Anyway, Amanda <laughs> Seyfried. Like Seyfried. <laughs> not Fried. No. Seyfried. It's yeah. Fred. I don't we know. definitely listen, Amanda. If you're listening, we want you on the show. So yeah. come on over and tell us how to say your last Amanda name. Amanda Seyfried. I think it's Seyfried. <laughs> um. Anyway, so she was in right. Mark's movie, and Mark was the director of the movie. So I tweeted about it, and oh I put God. the director's handle in Twitter, and I just put it out in the world, and I was like, oh, you know what? Oh, good for her. That's such a great movie. Like, I actually can't wait to see that. Didn't think about it again. And then, of course, the director of the movie, Mark, he <laughs> found that tweet, didn't you? Yeah. I didn't have to search hard. It was at me. It was just like I, I <laughs> That's woke how up. Twitter, that's <laughs> yeah, how Twitter no, works. Totally, I didn't have to go out of my way. I woke up in the morning. I was shooting a movie in New Orleans. Uh, I got a Google alert. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, my God. This I'm like, Teresa Palmer just tweeted out the tr trailer. She tweeted at me. And I'm like, I. it's funny because I had gone to the theater and saw Take Me Home Tonight. Is that the title? Mm -hmm. yep. um, yeah. Yeah. With, with my friend Tim and walked away from that movie being like, that girl is really good. And then there was some movie... You told Some me that you movie, thought I was hot. Was floating around. What happened to me being I, hot? You were like, shit, that girl's hot. I, I, no, no, you were good <laughs> in the movie, you're hot. But I then the hotness really came through for me. The hotness was solidified when I ended up Googling you and I, going on IMDb because oh. you were attached to maybe do a horror movie that I was maybe in the mix for. And so I looked you up and I spent like mm. a lot of time looking at all your photos. So when you tweeted at me, <laughs> oh. I'd already established. Was I in your wank bank? This girl is really, <laughs> really, really hot. Um, I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm at that sorry. point. I don't think at that point. Um, what? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. Not yet. Oh. Well, because that's not really, that's Dude. not really the way it work, works for me. Oh, um, <laughs> but. Okay. That's not really the way it works. But that was so great. Um <laughs> Yeah. I was I woke up in the morning, I was like, holy shit, Teresa Palmer, she's so hot. I can't believe she's and then I followed you back. And then we started DMing each other and now we have he a slipped into the DMs and, and then we both realized that we were vegan and we were all these things. And I had written a 10 page manifest list of what my husband was going to look like. And he's this oh and God. he's that and he's a cancer and he's an animal lover and he's a vegetarian and he's a this and all, all this sort of stuff. And he has green eyes and he so many things. And, um, and I actually found the list after we started dating. It was like six months into us dating. I was probably pregnant by then at that point, to be honest. And then um, we looked at, I looked at the list again with my friends and everyone was like, what the hell? That's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> you totally <laughs> manifested insane. him. Well, and then when I saw it, it really bugged me out because I had this moment of like, it's not like you didn't create me, but it was like, to a T, <laughs> like all my attributes, like this is really bizarre. Like I know I have existed That's before crazy. this moment but it felt like so <laughs> on point like you, you made me you, you yes you manifested me um yeah it was really cool it was really cool really cool yeah and then so we emailed for 40 days and it started off like quite nice little emails back and forth and then we did longer, longer emails to each other and we were going in depth and I'd ask him questions like, describe your way, like what are your dreams for life? And we both had this common thread of, you know, I had come from being with my mom who's like a mother Teresa 
in fact, she named me after Mother Teresa, who's just like so selfless. My mum would go out of her way constantly to help people and care for people and just this nurturing, caring, selfless woman. And then he has like his American version of that kind of mother as well. And so it was so deeply ingrained in the both of us that we were like, let's use our blessings to be a blessing. And we both truly Mm -hmm. fundamentally felt like we were put in the positions to have these platforms platforms so that we can affect positive change. And that was one of the big through lines throughout the 40 days that we were like, you and I are going to be this team that gets together and we're going to build so big and then we're going to help so many people. That was this idea that we had. Do you remember that, babe? Of course. It was the best. It was the best. Hi, poet. Daddy's doing a podcast right now. Oh, we got a little. Where's Nana? Classic. Where's Nanny? Baby, I'm recording right now. Oh, I'm, and she oh, might be it. naked from the bottom down. I can't see. Yeah, uh, go find Nanny. <laughs> she, I think she's in the in the living room. Um, <laughs> is she sleeping? <laughs> hey, Paula. We never know with my mum. <laughs> is it Paula? Mom, we're doing a podcast. Uh-huh. This is what um, happens when you don't have is... an au pair or you don't have a nanny. Yeah. <laughs> you have to rely yeah, you're, on. You're like, you're recording in two mom. different rooms and you're, yeah, yeah. you're like, so funny. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're, we're just recording. Can, do it. Can you go in the bathroom there? Yeah, nanny will get you a snack. Um, so, mom, yeah, maybe of course take her I on the tramp right? or something. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's what I love most. It's a thing that I often return mm. to when I'm starting to feel a little bit wobbly about all things, it feels great to be in a relationship that feels like a team, you know, and that you have common goals. Mm -hmm. And I like that idea of thinking of ourselves as a team. We have practice. There's practice all the time, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's what we take from all that practice Mm -hmm. and how you look at it the same way too. And then we, we learn stuff from it and then the relationship gets better the team gets better and when you're a good team it's great to come up with like long-term goals so we have something that not only Mm. just myself but we're working towards achieving together and that's the beautiful thing about being in a marriage in a relationship you know it's a massive opportunity Mm -hmm. to nourish this other person and in turn nourish yourself and then it's almost like you can achieve anything you know um Mm -hmm. and was it always that way I mean I I mean and I know so much of your story so I'm asking you know as a group question here but like was it always you know the way that I hear you speak at the both of you you have such beautiful incredible communication and like you know if I look back on my relationship and like the beginning of it like I was such a I was not a great communicator and I was afraid to communicate or mm-hmm. to show all the colors of like myself or to fail or to like make a mistake and I've watched you two in your relationship where even the moments that you have like faltered made mistakes like had major conflict in your relationship you guys have always done this thing where you communicate and you really sit in the uncomfortable Mm. um which to me is like so terrifying I mean only now at this point in my life able to really try to attempt to do that sitting in the uncomfortable with your partner and like you know understanding that they're going to see all the things, all the open Mm -hmm. wounds and scars and like stuff. Right. So Mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about how you got to where you are in that communication? Because as I'm listening to you say this, I'm like, yeah, that is beautiful in a way to communicate in a relationship. But like, how did you get there? Oh, it was messy. I can't wait to get into Mexico. (laughs) We're going to talk about Mexico and Sarah because she was involved in that. (laughs) Um, We have lots of stories to share where it has been very messy and it has not been smooth sailing. And I will say, and I just speak for the both of us right now, is we're in such a beautiful, amazing, open, communicative place 
but it did not start there. We kind of had the reverse of a lot of people where you hear about these typical marriages where it starts off amazing and there's like the butterflies and the honeymoon and it's the first few years are incredible and then they have kids and it's like, oh gosh, like it spirals and it gets challenging and then they get further and further away from each other. I feel like Mark and I, we got thrown into the deep end so quickly and straight off the bat that we were like, we either sink or we swim and we find our way back to each other and um, or even to each other in the first place. I think we sort of started kind of not, I, I look at you now and I'm like, I know you so well now. The fact that we were pregnant mm-hmm. and got married within one year, I look back on those photos, I'm like, I don't even really know you know you that well like the depths of you the layers of you that well and now I'm like oh my gosh you're so my person thank god I had the intuitive hit back then that okay this is my person there's a lot that we need to unravel here and try and like I guess just massage and work on but this is my person and I and it's gotten deeper and we've up leveled year after year but Gosh, it was a very wobbly. We've had a really kind of, we had a few wobbly years there where I was like, oh, are we going to stay together or are we not? Well, to add to that, I mean, yes, there's been a lot of mess and wobbliness. But I think, Sarah, that we have always had that level of communication. I think that's how we, in fact, have been able to get through all the mess um and Mm. for me personally speaking it's just because i've become pretty accustomed to being vulnerable by the time that i met Teresa. Mm. so i had really not ever felt like i needed to present myself like one way and then there's this other side of myself and then later she's gonna find that out like I think we initially did a really mm-hmm. good job of being really vulnerable with one another. And I think when I have always communicated really well and when the shit hit the fan, it's because we were able to communicate about it and really sit in uncomfortable moments that we were able to continue to evolve because that's the other thing mm. that I've been, because I, 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 similar ways, babe, I feel like, oh, and I didn't, maybe I didn't really know you then. But what's interesting is I did. I knew you then, but now you're something different. And so am I. And I mm-hmm. think yeah. that's the interesting thing about being in a relationship. Like, yes, I get it. There's one version of like, you meet a guy and really he's a piece of shit. And it's like, oh my God, I didn't know he was a piece <laughs> of shit um you know or has like all you know is lying has all these different like a real true different side to himself or there's us and the other version of it where you know yeah i was i not as mature um did i had i not done a lot more work on myself um at that point totally true but the thing that's interesting about being in a relationship is is you change so much mm, and and it's true. and couples get locked into a particular way of being with each other that you can feel afraid to change and mm-hmm. or to suddenly switch up the way you feel about something and yeah. um i think we have gotten to this beautiful place because we've continued to evolve and grow together and respect each other for where we're at and where we're going. And I think we just so happen to be lucky that we like the evolution of ourselves, you know? And mm. I think, but it has so been a nice. through line. We've been lucky that our communication was always good off the bat, I'd say. I feel like I had to work on that more than you. I feel like you have always been a really good communicator. I have, I wasn't really. I think I had come out of a relationship where I had felt stuck in a place where I wasn't able to be my true authentic self. And then I, I was with you and you're so beautifully open and you wear it all on your sleeve. And, um, it enabled me to find 
like rebirth those parts of myself where I was able to just be so fully revealing and not afraid of you judging me or thinking that what I had to say wasn't valid or that I wasn't interesting enough or academic enough or creative enough or all the, you know, my own traumas that I have. Um, You just was such a safe place for me. And that's also how I knew that I'd found my home because home should feel safe. Mm -hmm. Home should feel positive. That's how it should feel. And when I was with you, I felt so safe and so loved and I was able to show you all parts of myself, like embarrassing parts and silly parts and weird parts, (laughs) crazy parts, all the things that I am. And like, it's so funny. You even like yesterday rang me to be like, babe, I love the way that you will completely like change your day because there's a little injured bird in the yard and you just like feel that you have to do everything you can to save this little bird's life, which will is probably going to die this thing, but still you will completely (laughs) reorganize the shape of your day. Like these little things that you felt the need to ring me and be like, I love that part of you. And I want you to know Mm. how much I love that part of you. And that means a lot to me. So that's really, that's really beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I love that. That is so um, amazing. Communication is everything. That's what I love about this format too. Like the fact that you guys do a podcast and you have these conversations and you communicate with mm-hmm. other people and you can see your way different people communicate mm-hmm. and reflect and, you know, and I think, um, it, it's, it's really cool to sit back and listen to people talk, you know, and hear other people's stories and their I wanna, views on life. And their I want to dive into, uh, something that you've shared a little bit about before, which is addiction. And um, obviously you have come from an environment that was really challenging and I know you so well and I know that um, self-medicating was a part of a way for you to numb the pain, to help the pain feel like it can stay at bay. And... um, That's sort of how a lot of the trauma manifested itself was through addiction, um, prescription pill addiction in particular, which I didn't know a lot about when we first got together, but I did know you were sober um, and you had been sober for um, a pretty long time when we got together, which was a really beautiful part of your life. Sobriety was something that um, you felt really happy about and you're um, really committed to. And then when we were making The Ever After, which was a film that Mark and I made together and Sarah is actually in it as well. Um, And I was 12 weeks pregnant (laughs) when we started the movie. Um, You ended up having- And I was nine nine months pregnant. You were nine months pregnant. And we went, we were shooting one day and there was this weird psychic lady, (laughs) but she wasn't like, psychics are great. But this one was sort of, a weird psychic lady. We both like, oh, but she actually said something really cool that I still remember. <laughs> she was like, your baby boys are communicating with each other in the belly. And I was like, oh my gosh, she doesn't know I'm having a boy. That's right. But she was like, they're, they're talking to each other and they're friends. <laughs> We're like, oh my God, that's so cool. Mm. Um, anyway, so Mark, during that process, um, you relapsed and I talked a little bit about that on Instagram the other day. Um, and I just wanted, and, and that for us, it sh- shook the foundation of our relationship. I think it was a big wake up call for me that I was like, well, if I'm having a baby and I'm getting married to someone who has addiction, I should learn about what that means and learn how to be a supportive partner and just like, educate myself on on what that is and I hadn't at that point so I feel like you know if I could go back obviously I would have better tools on how to help support you through that but 
I remember at the time I found out and I like kicked you out of the house and broke up with you and it was so dramatic and I was like sobbing, crying, screaming. In fact, there are paparazzi photos of you and I. They thought it, the Daily Mail <laughs> did it and they were like, they're paparazzi. like rehearsing their, for their movie, The Ever After, but they didn't know that that was a real argument that we were having and I'm like screaming oh and God. yelling and <laughs> I'm like, get away from me, Trey. Oh, gosh. Like it was so dark and ugly at that time um, and you really needed mm. comfort from me and I, it took me a couple of weeks to get there. But let's just um, let's talk about that because Sarah's actually been on this journey of relapse with us as well um, a few years later when we were all in Mexico together, which we'll get to later. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to talk about my journey with sobriety. <laughs> um, and I wish I was just had the thought. I was like, oh, wow. I wish you guys had like some other podcasts where you could be like, talk to someone off stage in the studio and be like, pull those photos up and can bring up the photos, those paparazzi photos <laughs> of us. Yes. Um, I just remember being so yeah. like thankful that they thought we were rehearsing. I was like, oh my God, thank God. But it's crazy when I look back at those photos, <sighs> which I have yeah. a few times since then. And they're really, it's really wild to have this moment of like intense mm. pain captured totally candidly mm. um, because yes. it was at that point, you know, we were in the park getting into it. It's the lowest I've ever been. One of the lowest points I've ever been. I thought, you know, mm. man, like, How'd you fuck this up, man? You know, this is this is the best thing that's happened to you in your life. And it was really painful. Mm -hmm. It was really hard. Um, and it's wild that there's paparazzi photos of it. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my my journey with sobriety has been really colorful, really interesting. It's been such a beautiful part of my life. Um, learning about the way addiction works, um, you know, being to an incredible rehab. Uh, and being in and out of uh, various 12-step programs has really shaped um, my life and the way that I look at my life. It was also one of the first times getting into sobriety that I started to have a really defined relationship with spirituality, you know, and I had always considered myself mm -hmm. a spiritual person, would lay, as a little boy, lay up and look up at the stars and feel connected to something greater than myself and really feel it physically in my body. But it wasn't until getting into becoming sober that I started to really define what what um, my relationship is with a higher power because it's part of one of the fundamental steps and beginnings of getting sober, right? Is that you um, turn your will over to something greater than yourself, you know? Mm. And, and what's where a lot of people kind of struggle with that is A, if you equate you know, you, if you've had bad experiences in a particular religion or also this idea that you're not responsible for everything that you do in life, I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up and struggle, right? It's like, wait, I'm turning myself over to something. So um, it's been interesting there. I, I'm at a place now in my life where um, I've had to, I've changed the way that I look at sobriety for myself personally and it's been it's been an interesting journey you know i grew up with a dad who was a heroin junkie so my whole life i was like i don't want to be my dad you know uh heroin junkie alcoholic mm -hmm. and i was terrified of ever becoming my father and um was really lucky to have a mom who was really supportive and really open, but also struggled with certain boundaries, you know, and there's only so much you can do as a teenage yeah. mom. And then, so when I found myself as a teenager, 13, 14 years old in certain situations, I would, of course, I'm going to start drinking forties on the corner. And then soon after that, it was like smoking mm -hmm. blunts. And, um, I, really at first loved it 
loved smoking weed. Um, it was great. And in so many ways, I'm still grateful for that time period. There was something about me getting together with five or six of my really close friends and smoking a blunt together. We got creative. We got really introspective mm -hmm. and really connected. And it was a bonding experience. And it really was great. And it really worked for me for a long time. You know, I was a highly motivated getting high person. You know, I'd smoke weed and mm -hmm. I'd be ready to let, let's go to make a movie. Let's do this. Let's, you know, really yeah. like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And thankfully was never really that much into alcohol. Just drank forties because that's what people did. But like, I didn't really like the right. way that alcohol made me feel. Um, mm -hmm. and so I was like, oh, okay, cool. I just smoke weed and that worked for me. I started working. I, my dreams had come true. I was able to manage it. And a lot of the other successful people that I looked up to and I admired, they had a healthy relationship with marijuana as well. Um, but it wasn't until I think it was around 2000 and two or three that a friend of mine who has since passed um, from heroin introduced me to my first Vicodin in Los Angeles. Mm. And mm -hmm. it was one of the greatest days of my life. You know, I took this pill and I was riding in the backseat of his, his red Jeep driving down sunset and the sun just hit me right and I got that warm, euphoric feeling that mm -hmm. those opiates give you. And I was like, mm. oh my God, I want to feel like this all the time for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And it got me so quick then. And what was really sad about that, though, is that that's what got my father. He was just shooting it up with a needle into his arm. But for me, I just right. discreetly right. swallowed a pill. And so mm. I left LA, I, went, I got back to New York City with my girlfriend at the time and I immediately called my friend and I said, hey man, you gotta, you gotta FedEx me 20 of those pills. And he was like, sure, not a problem. Mm. Wired him some money. Next thing you know, you know, two days later, I'm opening up a FedEx and I'm like, I got these pills and now, whew, sense of relief, you know? And, and I'm like, uh. you know, and looking back on it, it was like happened so quickly. And then my story of like becoming yeah. a junkie rapidly took off. Um, and mm. it didn't no long, it no longer worked for me just to get high. I needed to take a couple pills and smoke weed on top of it in order to maintain a certain level. And with those pills, they're so yeah. awful. You know, you have to keep taking more, your tolerance gets high. So you, you know, what. I used to get really fucked up off of two pills. Now it requires six of them. And once you're taking six of them, you're flirting with like shutting down all your internal organs, you know, and it's, and yeah, then when you yeah. stop or you have a period of not using them, you feel withdrawal, you know, hardcore withdrawal. Yeah. And I really struggled with um, myself during that period because there was so much shame associated with it for me you know it's like oh mm -hmm. you're your dad now mm -hmm. man. you know look at what you've done and Ugh. that also uh, you know that was a, a period of my life where it also really ran up with this general sense of unhappiness of like i'm living my dream i'm a movie star i'm making movies why am i not happy why isn't this working mm -hmm. why isn't all this external shit that i thought was going to make me feel whole and complete why do i need right. drugs and mm -hmm. uh it wasn't until things got so bad that i went to my first aa meeting that i started to unpack the reasons why right and mm -hmm. you know the beautiful stuff about 12-step work is it really it's a it's a formula a program to have you go in there and start to examine your life in a methodical, mm. clear way, and then share it with another person who in turn holds you, you there's an accountability that happens there. And it's like it, an investigation, 
you know, when you first get sober, it's like looking into your deepest parts of yourself, you know, your whole being and really unpacking it um, and making inventory lists of like all your sexual partners, all the, all the amends you want to make. Right. And you start to see and create, you see these patterns and these, and it, it sends you on the way to taking a look at why. And it didn't yeah. take long to realize that, oh, well, it's because I was abandoned by my father and I, I have this deep, deep wound there, you know, my dad leaving yeah. me at the time that he did and a combination of not having a dad and then being with my mom in really extreme situations that kids shouldn't be in, I had all this trauma you know, and mm. I never, it never got resolved. You know, I got the, the dreams happened, the things happened and those would bring moments of happiness. But because I hadn't unpacked the trauma in my life, I wasn't able to really fully enjoy them and was relying on self-medicating in order to feel relief from this deep seated pain of abandonment really. And mm -hmm. not feeling love, not feeling worth it. And then I started to realize, oh, wow, I probably wanted to become an actor so that I could get esteem because I had none. Because, you know, what I was programmed to think mm -hmm. when I was a kid is that you're unlovable and you're not worth it, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah. mm -hmm. of course, it was like, I want to be a movie star because I want people to like me. I want people to think I'm yeah, special. I yeah. want to get attention. I need attention which is really like, I need love, you know? And, and I didn't have mm -hmm. it for myself in a real meaningful way. And it's a dangerous thing when, you know, you're a teenager and in your early twenties and start to become successful without taking a look at the trauma that you may have experienced in your life and working through it and getting to a solid place. Cause what can happen is you can get all this external validation you can get money, you can get things, you can get the job that you want, the girl that you want. And quietly inside, you're like, wait, why the fuck am I not happy? Why am I depressed? What's going on? Something's mm -hmm. wrong with me. And that's the beautiful thing about sobriety is it allows you to get in there and, and take a look at it. Um, mm. And I'm so grateful that I have. I mean, I... Should I get into the, <laughs> and then I've had periods of sobriety and then hardcore relapses. Like I was sober for about mm, four and a half, maybe five it. years before. Yeah. Before we met babe. And yeah. which was great about that is, and part of the reason why I think I was so, you know, able to be so vulnerable and communicate so well with you is that I spent the last four years of my life being a single dad and in a, a 12 step program that really, I got comfortable in my skin. You know, I started to really sit mm. with and get an awareness of who I really am and what are the things that I really want and what really matters to me. And I really created the space to have you come in. And I knew that when I was going to meet mm. someone in this period of my life, it needed to be meaningful, you know, that I wasn't just going to bring random women around my son you know, and, right. mm -hmm. um, and so, but at that point I was still in the getting to know my shit, you know, and sitting with it, not mm -hmm. really dealing with it yet. Just getting an awareness mm -hmm. surrounding it. Okay. So this feels like a really good place to stop, uh, for part one of this, um, podcast. And we will be picking up again next week with Mark and you guys do not want to miss the amazing part two of his story. And, um, we'll learn so, so, so many more things. So, um, we love you daisies. You can find us on Apple podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye Woo! guys. Bye. Thank you.